Welcome to our evening service, and let us commence our worship by singing to the Lord's praise from Psalm 147. All our psalms this evening will be from the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 147. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good. Praise to our God to sing. For it is pleasant unto praise, it is a comely thing. God doth build up Jerusalem, and he it is alone, that the dispersed of Israel doth gather unto one. Those that are broken in their heart and grieved in their minds, he healeth, and their painful wounds he tenderly abides. He counts the number of the stars, he names them every one. Great is our Lord, and of great power, his wisdom such can none. We shall sing down to the verse marked 8, that is Psalm 147, verse 1 to 8, to the Lord's praise. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good. Praise to our God to sing. <coughs> praise ye the Lord, for it is good. Praise to together in prayer. Eternal and ever 
blessed Lord, we would seek that we be mindful of who thou art as we draw near to thee in this act of worship, to be kept mindful that thou art the high and lofty one, that thou art the one who inhabiteth eternity, to remember that we are the works of thine own hands, that we are the created, and that thou art our creator, that thou art the one who is of purer eye than to look upon sin, that thou art holy. But blessed be thy name that thou hast made provision for us in and through thine own Son, through whom we can have access into thine own presence, that we can enter with boldness and confidence into the very throne room of God, that we can lay out our petitions before thee, knowing that thou art a God who can truly, out of the riches of thine own grace, meet with the needs of each and every one of us. And so we come before thee at this hour, O Lord, confessing our sins, that we sin in thought, in word, and in deed. And blessed be thy name for that promise that thou hast given to us, that if we confess our sins, that thou art faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we give thanks that when thou dost forgive our sins, that thou do so in a way that is just, and that because that our sins were laid upon thine own Son, that he bore our sins in his own body on the cross, that he was the one who died, and who was buried and who rose again, triumphant over death and the grave, and we give thanks, O Lord, that he is the one who ascended to thine own right hand. And there that he ministers on behalf of those given to him by thee in the covenant of redemption, and for whom he came into this world, taking our nature into himself, and that he borne what the consequences of our sin in that nature in which he took to himself, that he ascended with that nature to thine own right hand, and there that he ministers on our behalf in the intercession that he makes for us. But we give thanks to thee, O Lord, for the great promise that thou hast given to us, that he shall return again, and this time not to offer himself again as a sacrifice for sin, but to ingather his people and to bring them in body and soul into the inheritance that he has prepared for them. And we give thanks that we can have that living hope uh, through the gospel, and that uh, all thy promises have been sealed for us through the blood of the everlasting covenant. We seek, O Lord, that it may please thee to grant to us thine own spirit as we come around thine own word, uh, to give us the listening ear and the understanding heart, to lead us into thine own word, that we may be strengthened in our faith and encouraged in our walk. We pray, Lord, that thou would... Um, Grant to us that we would be focused upon thy word, for we acknowledge that there are many things around us to distract our minds and our thoughts away. But grant to us, O Lord, that we would be focused upon what thou hast to say to us at this evening hour through the preaching of thine own word. We acknowledge, O Lord, that we are dependent upon thy spirit, for without thy spirit we can do nothing. And without thy spirit our words will remain just words. But we pray, O Lord, that thou would take our words 
and make it effectual in the lives of thine own. We pray, Lord, for all who have assembled like we have this evening throughout our islands and throughout our nation, and all thy servants who have gone forth with thy word. Grant to them the unction of thy spirit, that they may be able to proclaim thy truth with boldness and confidence, knowing that it shall not return unto thee empty, but shall accomplish that for which thou hast sent it forth. We pray for the congregation here, for every home and family. Thou art the all-knowing God, thou knowest their needs. And we pray, O Lord, that out of the riches of thy grace that thou would meet with the needs of each one. We give thee thanks, O Lord, for all the tokens of thy goodness and kindness to us in things that are temporal as well as in things that are spiritual. We pray for the minister of the congregation and pray, O Lord, that thou would bless him in his home and his family and that thou would bring them back uh, here uh, to the congregation refreshed and we give thee thanks, O Lord, for all the tokens of thy goodness that has been given to them in these days. We pray, Lord, for those who have been bereft of loved ones. The voice of death is so often heard among us, and we pray that thou would bless them and meet with them at their own particular uh, point of need. Bless to us, we pray thee, the when thou art receiving thine own servants in accordance to thine own promise. For thy own desire is that those whom thou hast redeemed, that they will be with thee and that they would behold thine own glory. Oh, we pray, Lord, that, uh, that uh, the taking of thine own servants to be with thee would be blessed to, to our communities. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, thou would uh, impress upon our people that we are all on the self-same journey, that we are all uh, going to our long home, and that our long home depends upon our relationship with thyself. O oh, that thou would impress upon our people through thy spirit uh, the urgency of this matter, the urgency of being reconciled to our God, the urgency of having peace with God. We pray, Lord, that thou would bless thy people here. May we be true and faithful witnesses uh, for thee. Bless those uh, who are ill, those who are in hospital or at home. We pray, Lord, that thou would bless them and those who take care of them. We pray, Lord, that thou would bless the office bearers of the congregation and the very duties that are upon them. Pray for the one who leads us in the praise. And we pray, O oh Lord, that our worship at this evening hour may be accepted by Thee, not because of any merit that belongs to us, but through the merits of Thine own Son. And all that we ask with the forgiveness of our sins, in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. We shall further sing from Psalm 68. Psalm 68 at verse 18. Thou hast, O Lord, most glorious, ascended up on high, and in triumph victorious led captive captivity. Thou hast received gifts for men, for such as did rebel, gay even for them that God the Lord in midst of them might dwell. Blessed be the Lord, who is to us of our salvation God, who daily with his benefits as plenteously doth load. He of salvation is the God who is our God most strong, and unto God the Lord from death the issues do belong. We shall sing these verses to the Lord's praise of Psalm 68, verse 18 to 20. Thou hast, O Lord most glorious, ascended up on high. Thou hast, O Lord most glorious, ascended up on high, and in triumph victorious led captive, captive. Thou hast received. 
gifts for men, for such as did rebel, yea, for them that called the Lord in midst of them I dwell. Bless me. Testament in the book of Revelation and chapter 5. The book of Revelation and chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look unto it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, The four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honour and glory and might for ever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. May the Lord bless unto us the reading of that portion of his word. We shall continue to sing from Psalm 73. Psalm 73 at verse 23. Nevertheless, continually, O Lord, I am with thee. Thou dost me hold by my right hand, and still upholdest me. Thou with thy counsel, while I live, wilt me conduct and guide, and to thy glory afterward receive me to abide. Whom have I in the heavens high but thee, O Lord, alone? And in the earth, whom I desire besides thee, there is none. My flesh and heart doth faint and fail, but God doth fail me never. For of my heart God is a strength and portion forever. 
For lo, they that are far from thee forever perish shall. Them that are whoring from thee go, thou hast destroyed all. But surely it is good for me that I draw near to God. In God I trust that all thy works I may declare abroad. We shall sing these verses to the Lord's praise from Psalm 73, verse 23, to the end of the psalm. Nevertheless, continually, O Lord, I am with thee. Never the less Let us turn back to the portion of Scripture that we read together in the book of Revelation and chapter 5. And we can read from the beginning. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. 
And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. This book is called Revelation. It means uh, an unveiling, a, a disclosure, a, a revealing. The unveiling of something previously unrevealed. The writer of the book is John. Now, we believe that this is indeed John the Apostle, the same John that wrote the first, second, and third epistles of John, and, of course, the Gospel of John. We'll read of John's circumstances as he writes the book. Uh, he says, I, John, your brother and partner in tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So that John, the author of this book, or the writer of this book, wrote this book from a vision that he received on the island of Patmos. And the book was probably written in the late first century, probably around 90 A.D., at the beginning of the book, we have these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. This is a revelation that God gave him. And the him there in chapter 1, verse 1, is not speaking of John who is the writer of this book. It is speaking of Jesus Christ. God gave this revelation to Christ, to the exalted Christ, to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. The content of what is unveiled by God to Jesus Christ is conveyed to John by an angel on the Isle of Patmos. We must remember that God the Father is the ultimate source of all revelation. God the Son is the agent through whom this revelation is imparted to mankind. This is even true of the exalted Christ. And the fact that God gave this revelation uh, to Christ to show to his servants the thing that must soon take place reminds us of the mediatorship of Christ. That even in his exalted state, he is still the mediator for his people. Because his mediatorship means that Jesus could say, even in the days of his humiliation, the Father is greater than I. How could that be true if they were of the same in substance, equal in power and glory? It could only be true of Christ in his mediatorship. And so what we find here is that it gives us evidence that Christ is still exercising his mediatorship even in his exalted state. So this book is a revelation from and about Jesus Christ. Not in the sense that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John revealed Christ. The Gospels revealed the humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the book of Revelation, instead of the humiliated Christ, 
what we have in this unveiling is the exalted and glorified Jesus Christ. He draws back the curtain which hides from our eyes the invisible world and the future of this world. And he allows us to see a glimpse of that invisible world and what is to happen to this world in which we live. The book was first written to Christians who were being persecuted, martyred, and sent to the stake or fed to the lions unless they denied their faith and gave worship to the emperor of Rome. These people who were persecuted needed encouragement. They needed to be strengthened in their faith and encouraged in their walk. And this book is given to them in order to serve that purpose. Therefore, our Lord Jesus has firstly described for us at the beginning of the book as being the faithful or dependable witness. That is described then as the first begotten from the dead. And the third description that we have at the beginning of the book is that he is the prince of the kings of the earth. That is the doctrine of divine sovereignty, that he is the sovereign Lord, that he is in control. And that is always something that we have to remind ourselves in the chaos that we see and the tensions that we see in our world today. It is always good for us to remember that there is a sovereign Lord, the sovereign Lord who is in control of all things, and the sovereign Lord who is working out his own redemptive plan for his people, for his redeemed. Our focus this evening will be on the words found in verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. The book of Revelation uh, is an unveiling of the plan of God for the history of the world, and especially the history regarding the church, his redeemed people. There is probably no book in the Bible that has led to so many opinions and interpretations uh, among believers as the book of Revelation. We are told that John Calvin declined to preach from Revelation. And Martin Luther once argued for the removal of this book from the canon of Scripture. It is a book that is full of symbolic images. And maybe this is one of the problems, or perhaps the greatest problem that we have with the book of Revelation. For sometimes you can get so bogged down in the details. But it is important for us not to get lost in the details, but to try and see this book of Revelation and all its details within the bigger picture of Scripture. And what is the big picture of Scripture? Well, we have already alluded to it. From Genesis to Revelation, it is all about God's redemptive plan. That plan that began in eternity in the covenant of redemption. That plan that was revealed in the promise of the Garden of Eden regarding the seed of the woman. That plan that was embodied in Jesus Christ. And that plan that shall be completed at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the bigger picture. And we should look at this book of Revelation in the light of that bigger picture. If this last book of the Bible is about anything, it is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Redeemer of sinners. It is a book that encompasses the past, 
the present and the future. All the events of this book center around visions and symbols of the resurrected Christ, who alone has the authority to judge the earth, who has alone has the authority eventually to bring about the new heavens and the new earth, wherein shall dwell righteousness. Now, sometimes in the book, John is spoken to by the Lord Jesus himself, and, and other times elders speak to John. There are times we hear a voice from heaven speaking to him. But the process of the delivery of this revelation, the source of it, was from God. Given to Jesus Christ, sent by Christ through an angel to the apostle John, as he was in Patmos. Now that's the title of the book. It is about Christ. It is from Christ. In the previous chapter, chapter 4, John was admitted through a door into heaven to see the worship around God's throne. In chapter 5, which we have this evening, John tells us what he continued to see, starting with an object that he saw in the hand of God. I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, there are many theories about the scroll. But the best understanding of the scroll, in my opinion, is that it represents the entirety of God's will for history, both in judging the wicked and in redeeming his people. The scroll is written both within and on the back side. It is written on both sides, showing that it contains the entire story of God's will. This revelation was given, as we have noted, to John by an angel in order to encourage believers who were going through persecution. In every generation of Christians, the hope of the Lord's return keeps Christians going. When the going gets tough, it is always good to remember and to bring to our minds the Lord is coming back. The Lord's return. Maybe we're not giving enough time to, in our thinking or in our fellowship or in our talking to the Lord's return. He is coming back. And here the Revelation speaks of the Christian hope. And it was meant to give strength to John and the persecuted church in the days of John. And it's still its purpose today. This book is given to us to encourage us, to strengthen our faith, to encourage us in our walk, and to look with expectation and anticipation to the day of our Lord's return to the day of our resurrection, to the day when we, in body and soul, will enter into our inheritance, when our redemption will be brought to completion. Our redemption is not brought to completion on the day of our death. It is brought to completion on the day of our resurrection when the soul and the body is united once again and brought into the full enjoy of God forever. Paul often speaks to, uh, regarding that day. And what day is he thinking of? Is he thinking of the day of his death? Well, he knew that for him to die was uh, going to begin but he is looking beyond the day of his death. He is looking to the day of his resurrection. He is looking to the day of his glorification. He is looking to that day when he shall 
be made like unto Christ. Isn't that what he says there to the church at Philippi? As he looked for that day when his body would be made like unto the glorious body of Christ. Is that not the apex of our redemption? Is that not the top stone of our redemption? Is that not why Christ has redeemed us? As Paul says in writing to the letter uh, to Rome, he says that we have been called, that we have been redeemed to be made conformable to the Son. Well, here then we have given to us that spoke to encourage us and to strengthen us. It is a book that was originally given to those early Christians, and it was given to them not to satisfy their curiosity about the future. It was given to them to pastorally in order to comfort them, to give them hope for the days that uh, lay ahead. It was given to John, a persecuted Christian. It was written to the churches of Asia Minor, persecuted churches, and was written for the purpose of encouraging them and exhorting them by reassuring them of this central fact that Jesus Christ controls the course and the climax of history, that the scroll is in him, or that the scroll is with him. John says, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. John begins to weep loudly, and one of the elders says to him, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David are both messianic titles, telling us that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah, as foretold in Genesis 49, where we read, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And also that he would be a descendant of David. We find that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In other words, that he would be a king with authority, power, and strength. They are both messianic titles. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And then we come to verse 6. John then looks, and he wasn't prepared for the sight that was set before him. He was looking for a very graphic and majestic sight. But instead, what he saw was that between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, he says, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the four twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. John looks, and he was expecting to see a lion, but instead he saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. 
He was shown that the lamb is in full control of the kosh and climax of history. Now the focus, our focus this evening is going to be upon these words of verse 6. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Now as we noted this morning, lambs have a tremendous religious significance, especially among the Jewish people, because they were constantly used in their sacrificial worship. The lamb was to remain sacrificed twice a day. They sacrificed a lamb as a burnt offering, as in the morning and evening sacrifice. Lambs were constantly used as a sacrifice. The main annual feast, as we noted in the morning, the Passover, bore witness to the importance of the lamb, as it was through the shedding and sprinkling of the blood of the Passover lamb that their fathers were set free from the last plague and from the bondage of Egypt, a feast that they were commanded to keep annually. And here we see John, and he looks, and he's expecting a lion, but he beholds a lamb standing as though it had been slain. The word that John uses here for lamb is not the usual word, but a word that can be translated a little lamb. John expected to see a lion, but instead he saw a little lamb as though it had been slain. Now for Israel, for the Jews, the slain lamb upon the altar was a powerful statement that reminded them that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But it also reminded the people that the lamb was a substitute, and we spoke about that uh, somewhat in the morning. The man would place his hands on the head of the lamb, thus symbolically becoming identified uh, with uh, the lamb. And... uh, In order to receive the benefits of the atonement, the lamb was killed in the place of the offerer. And all prefigured what was true of the lamb of God, uh, Jesus Christ. John looked, and he says here, between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. In the authorised version, we read it like this. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain. Now, John had been with Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. And we know from the Gospels that he was one of the three that were singled out as very close to Jesus, along with Peter and James. They were there and on special occasions in the life of uh, Jesus. Uh, he, G- John was present uh, with Jesus, uh, for instance, on the Mount of Transfiguration. John was there also in the Garden of Gethsemane, where, when the Lord Jesus was in agony of uh, prayer. John was the only disciple who remained at the foot of the cross, And some of the last words of our Lord on earth were spoken to John, the disciple. Remember when he put his mother Mary into the care of uh, John and said to John, Behold thy mother. He came to the tomb after the woman broke the news that the tomb was empty. And we read that when he went in, uh, that he went in, that he saw and believed. John saw the Lord with the rest of the disciples after he had risen from the dead and saw the Lord ascending him to heaven from the Mount of Olives. But now he sees him between or in the midst of the throne in heaven. He sees him now as the unthroned Lamb of God. He sees him now in his exalted state, the enthroned Lamb of God. He saw him as a slain lamb. In the prophecy of Isaiah, Jesus is likened to a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And that imagery is 
immensely powerful. The Lamb of God being led to the place of slaughter. The, the word led to the slaughter does not imply any struggle, but rather we see a unique submission. He was not overpowered, but he chose to submit himself to those who came to arrest him because it was the Father's will for the salvation of sinners like me and you. He is led to the slaughter, a word which is commonly uh, employed uh, in reference to butchery or a slaughterhouse. Uh, the cross of Golgotha was a piece of horrendous suffering, but it was also the place of the only sacrifice that could deal with sin. And so John looks at the enthroned lamb as if it had been slain. God's redemptive plan for the salvation of sinners involved not only that Jesus as the lamb must be crucified and slain, but that he must also rise again. And that, that was part of his obedience. Jesus said, as recorded in the Gospel of John, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. The Lamb must die. The Lamb must give us life. But the lamb must rise again, but he must also be enthroned. It was not enough that the lamb die. It was not enough that the lamb rise again, but the lamb must be enthroned. There must be an enthronement of Jesus as the slain lamb of God. A reminder to us that the work of Jesus as our Redeemer had to continue long beyond that of Golgotha. It doesn't terminate at Golgotha. Golgotha is only a point. Our redemption goes beyond Golgotha. The work of our Redeemer goes beyond Golgotha. So John here sees him enthroned as the slain lamb. When Jesus cried there from the cross and he cried out and he said, it is finished. It was not as if he was now withdrawing from his work, as if everything had been done, that there was nothing more for him to do. But he was to continue with his redemptive engagement and commitment. His lying in the tomb under the power of death was part of his redemptive engagement. For it is clear, made clear to us that he must taste death. The writer to the Hebrew puts it like this. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God that he might test, taste death for everyone. Jesus in the tomb was tasting death for his people. When he rose from the tomb and ascended to the right hand of the Father, he continues his redeeming work. The end for which he ascended was to appear in the presence of God for us. And that for the following reason. To make effectual the atonement that he had made for sin on, on the behalf of his people, to, to undertake the protection of his people, to plead their case against all the accusations of the devil, to intercede for them, to ensure the communication of all grace and glory and all the benefits of his atoning work, all the supplies of the Spirit, and the accomplishment of all of the covenant promises towards them. What John saw was a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Some people ask the question, some people think it's a foolish question, 
But it is a question that is very often asked. Does Christ still bear the marks of the crucifixion? And there are various opinions regarding that. I, at one time, was of the opinion that Christ did uh, me, uh, that Christ did bear the marks of the crucifixion even in his exalted state. But I have changed my opinion on that in recent times. I know that his resurrection body did, did uh, bear the marks of his crucifixion. We'll remember that when he met with Thomas. We know that his resurrection body did bear the marks of the crucifixion. And I believe that that was because it was in order to comfort and encourage the church at that time. His resurrected body was very different from the body of his humiliation. Because in the resurrected body, he could go through the doors without the doors being opened. He could enter rooms without doors being opened. He had that power in his resurrected body. But I believe that in his ascension, that body also underwent a change. And it is the ascended body in which he shall return, which shall be a glorious body. A glorious body. And we shall be made like into his glorious body. There will be no defect. There will be no blemish in our bodies. We shall be made like his glorious body, a body without defect, without blemish. So I am of the opinion that he doesn't bear the marks of the crucifixion. But as I said, I'm not being dogmatic about it. Maybe it is a silly question. Maybe it is a silly thought. But we do ask that question so often in our fellowships. But here, let us come to what John saw. He saw a lamb standing. A, slant, a lamb standing. Now, very often the Bible speaks of Jesus as sitting on the right hand of the throne of God. The writer to the Hebrews in reference to Jesus writes, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And later on he says in the same letter, We have such an high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. The image of Christ as sitting brings before us completeness. As the writer to the Hebrew continues to bring this before us, he says, every priest stands daily at his service. The priest in the, in the tabernacle, in the temple, wasn't allowed to sit. He was always standing. Standing daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But, he says, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. In the words of Paul, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The slain lamb, now enthroned. There is a remarkable scene brought before us in the death of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, where we read, But he, that is Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Instead of seeing Jesus sitting, Stephen saw him standing. 
He was standing to receive his soul, the soul of Stephen. And that's a wonderful thought, is it not? That the Lord stands to receive the soul of all his people. Of all his people. Stands to receive their soul. Earlier in the book of Revelation, John sees the lamb of the slain lamb, not as sitting, but standing. Jesus is standing in the midst of the throne, not merely as a risen Lord, but as the one who had been slain and is now alive. And he's in the midst of the throne. He is in full control. The scroll is in his hand. The scroll is in his hand. John sees the enthroned lamb. Another interesting feature of John seeing uh, a lamb is that often God's people are referred to as sheep in the Bible and Christ as their shepherd. I cannot but think that his identification as a lamb has reference to the fact that he took the nature of the flock, that he came to save, and he came and in order to save, he took the nature of the flock that he came to save. He took our human nature, and he did not discard it. But he took it to the very throne room of God, and now appears in heaven for us in that very nature that he took into himself. There in the midst of the throne is humanity. There in the midst of the throne, in the words of another, is the dust of the earth. There in the midst of the throne is humanity, that nature that he took into himself. It is important for us not to forget that when he ascended, he carried with him his whole person, and that includes the humanity in which he served and suffered and died, and he took it with him to a higher point than the highest of all creatures, so that the very nature which he took on him in this world is now exalted in glory. As John looks, he sees the Lamb. He sees that he has not left his human nature behind, but he is in taking that human nature with him to the right hand of the majesty on high, to the very center of the throne. He looks and he sees the Lamb as it had been slain. He sees the God-man. He sees Jesus Christ. Then John sees the Lamb, not sitting, but standing. Standing in the midst of the throne, not merely as the risen Lord, but as the Lamb that had been slain, already, already slain. That he is so worthy to open the scroll. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. He is exalted to a position of power and authority. He still functions, as we noted at the beginning of our service, as our mediator. He still functions as prophet, priest, and king. The slain lamb standing and taking the scroll is really reference to power being put into his hand. A power to rule over the church. A power to rule over the universe. When he ascended up into heaven, he ascended as the mediator of the church, and we know the mediatorship of Christ includes these functions of prophet, priest, and king. Therefore, when Christ ascended, and when he became enthroned in heaven, it wasn't simply to lead a life of glory, majesty, and blessedness, but a life of mediatorship as the prophet, priest, and king of the church. Our present Safety and our future eternal salvation depends upon his exercising of his mediatorship in heaven. He continues as our prophet, priest, and king. He has entered into heaven to appear in the presence of God for us. 
In heaven, he exercises all his love, all his compassion, all his pity and care towards his church and every member of his church. From there, he makes effectual the atonement that he has made for sin by procuring the application of the benefits of his atoning work in reconciliation and peace with God into the soul and the consciences of his people. He undertakes his people's protection. He pleads on their behalf against all the accusations of Satan because Satan get accuses his pe- the people, the redeemed before God. But Christ is their advocate at the throne of grace, frustrating all Satan's attempts. He intercedes for them, communicates to his people all the grace and the glory and the supplies of the Spirit in the accomplishment of all the covenant promises towards them. And John looks and he sees the enthroned Lamb and he sees the Lamb standing. And he, and he says that much singing and praise was served. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And the angels sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then he looks and he sees the whole cosmos sang, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Further on in this book of Revelation, we read, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, marriage practices in biblical times were different from ours today. First, the father chose the bride and arranged the betrothal of that, their child. And once the terms of the marriage were publicly accepted, the covenant union between the man and the woman was established and the couple were legally married. So there's the choosing, the betrothal, and then the marriage. But following the choosing, betrothal, and marriage, was a marriage supper. Four steps. The choosing, the betrothal, the marriage, and then the marriage supper. This was the consummation of the marriage, the marriage supper. The supper was the culmination of the whole ceremony from the choosing to the marriage. And for us, spiritually, the choosing took place in eternity. We were chosen as a bride of Christ in eternity. Chosen by the Father as a bride for a son in eternity. The betrothal takes place in this world. And the marriage takes place when we are received home by the bridegroom. Remember how we see that the bridegroom would come after he had prepared everything For this bride, the bridegroom would come and he would take his bride with him to the place or the home that he had prepared for her. And the marriage, spiritually, is the same. The bridegroom comes and receives his bride and takes his bride to the place that he has prepared for her. But there is more to come. There is a marriage supper, which also takes place in eternity. When the bridegroom took his bride home to be with himself, there was yet more to come. There was the marriage supper. And that is true also spiritually, as chapter 19 of this book tells us of the marriage supper of the Lamb. The betrothal. And the marriage takes place at different time for each Christian. But our entrance to the supper will be together. The catechism says the soul of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory. And their bodies, being still united to Christ, do rest in their graves till the resurrection. 
the marriage supper is the day of resurrection. As the Catechism states, at the resurrection, believers being raised up in glory shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. That still awaits us. And we'll have that together. The marriage supper of the Lamb will be there together at the same time because the marriage supper speaks of the day of our glorification, when we shall be made like unto the glorious body of Christ. Our bodies that was rotting in the grave, raised and made like the glorious body of our beloved, we shall sit at the supper with him in our glorified bodies. We shall sit at the supper and we shall be with Christ forever. So many things could be said about the marriage supper of the Lamb. One hardly knows where to start, and one hardly knows where to end. But we know that on that day, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor cry, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. In heaven, around the marriage supper with Jesus, we shall enjoy him intimately, and forever. What great comfort this vision of John as seeing the slain lamb standing in the midst of the throne. And what comfort it is for me and you tonight, knowing that when the old heaven and earth passes away, there will be a new heaven and a new earth wherein shall dwell righteousness and there will be no longer anything accursed. But the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They shall see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or, or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and forever. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living waters, and God shall, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So what a great encouragement this sight was for John, and what a great encouragement this sight is for me and you tonight. That he saw the slain lamb standing, enthroned, the scroll in his hand, in full control. And he is working out through history, he is working out to this great moment of his marriage supper, of his marriage supper. He, the bride's been chosen. The bride has been betrothed. He pre receives the bride in the, in, the, in, the, in the appointed time. He brings the bride to the place that he has prepared for her. But there is something beyond that. There is a marriage supper, the apex of the whole redemptive plan, when we shall sit with him, with our glorified bodies, when we shall have that intimacy with him, with body and soul. What an encouragement when the, when the going gets tough, when things look so, so chaotic. What an encouragement. Who are like you, the people of God, who is looking forward to this day? And it is all yours by the grace of God. Not because you've done anything yourself. It is all yours by the grace of God. May this vision of John be an encouragement for us in the days that lie ahead. May the Lord bless our thoughts. Let us pray. Eternal and ever blessed Lord, we thank thee that in the midst of the chaos and the tensions that we see in the world around us, even at this time, that we know that there is one who is sovereign, that there is one who is in control, there is one who is 
working out his redemptive purpose regarding his church. And so we give thanks that we can have that comfort, that that can be an encouragement for us, that when things get tough and when things look so um, so bad and, and, and when things leave, would leave us almost in a state of despair, that we can look to this vision of seeing the Lamb standing in the midst of the throne. We give thanks to thee, O Lord, for all the promises in thy word. And we pray that thou would continue with us in coming days. And all that we ask with the forgiveness of our sin is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We shall conclude by singing in Psalm 24, at verse 7 to the end of the psalm. Ye gates, lift up your heads on high, ye doors that last for aye. Be lifted up, that so the King of glory enter me. But who of glory is the King, the mighty Lord is this, even that same Lord that great in might and strong in battle is. We shall sing uh, from verse 7 to the end of the psalm. That is Psalm 24, these verses to the Lord's praise. Ye gates, lift up your heads on high, ye doors that last for aye. <coughs> Ye gates lift up your heads on high Ye doors that last for Be lifted up that so the King of glory Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.